Today is the fourth day of the October-November 85 retreat. At first a brief announcement concerning windows with the very cold air coming in upon us at night. Let us please be sensitive to, particularly in the bedrooms, to different people's different needs for fresh air to come through the windows and to communicate these needs. Maybe the windows are too wide open, maybe they're too far closed, and by writing notes, maybe a couple times back and forth, one can arrive at a compromise, how much air to let in. Here in this room, if one sits at a place where the windows are consistently too far open, or and either to talk with Debbie and Matt about it, or during a round of walking one can maybe adjust the window reasonably, or exchange a seat, find a seat where it's not drafty. We have no at least conscious ideas about keeping this place cold to give ourselves that kind of experience to live with a cold. <laughs> If it happens that way, let's try to do something about it. So everyone is reasonably comfortable. Yesterday, I think most of the talk was devoted to talking about self-image, less time to having images of others and what this does to relationship. If one has observed during the day, evening, morning, the functioning of the mind, maybe one has found that there is this constant process of image making going on. New images for new situations, and also the holding on to old images of what I am, what I should be, what the others are, should be, shouldn't be. Maybe one has reflected upon what we briefly mentioned, that as long as human being are attached, deeply attached, unconsciously, traditionally attached to images about themselves, personal images, family name images, professional images, national or tribal images, religious images, political images, that there is no possibility of peace on earth and goodwill to men and women. None. We said that if in a small country like Lebanon, if Jews dropped all attachment to being Jews and the tradition, and so did the Palestinians and the Muslims and the Christians. And all the factions of these religions, political, <coughs> political factions, national groups, then not one person, unless totally psychotic, would pick up a gun and shoot someone else. One shoots at images. But unfortunately, they're human, flesh and blood people. 
behind these images, behind the one who shoots and behind the one who is killed. So does one get a feeling for the danger of images and for the great need to see them in oneself. One can't make somebody else see an image. One can try, but whether that person sees it, becomes aware of it, sees the danger and the necessity to be free of it, that's up to the other person. But can it happen in oneself? I think that's what we ask. Seeing that otherwise no truly loving, caring human relationship is possible. A relationship free from hatred, rivalry, feelings of mutual exploitation, being exploited, therefore needing to exploit the other, all based on images. You could say, well, no, it's, it's a fact that that's what human beings do to each other, but one has to probe into this. What is the basis for it? Because there are other human urges like lust for power, for possessions, for territory. But we're not right now analyzing the whole human condition. We're looking at image making because that can be observed in oneself and may be dropped, come to an end in oneself. If it is clearly seen where it comes from, what it does, and seeing the relationship between how one lives oneself with one's images in relationship with people of whom one has images, the difficulty difficulties of relationship arising out of that. We will go into that in a moment. And the relationship of that with how the world lives, what happens in all these war-torn, terrorist, terrorism-torn countries, of which none seems to be excluded anymore. It was this past fall on a vacation trip that someone asked me after very scant conversation about it, why, why is ego a problem to you? To me, that person said, to me it is not. I know that I like to be on top, the best, compete, but that's a joy, it's a zest in my life, and the joy of being right, I pay willingly with the depression when I'm not right. And other pleasures and displeasures were mentioned. The person felt that there's no need to make a problem out of it. I'll, I'll take the good with the bad, but this is life. And then person proceeded to say, <clears throat> you, Tony, make an assumption which I don't make, and I see it merely as an assumption, that there is a relationship between how we live on the micro level, alone and with each other, and what happens in the world on a macro level, a large level. I don't make that connection. And I don't see it. It's a theoretical assumption on your part. And people have told me that at times, that how do you make that jump? It seems to be very theoretical to me, very abstract. And that was not just argumentatively, but person seriously felt that this couldn't be seen, the connection. 
But if one, if it somehow, somewhere rings true, or possibly true, then will one begin to observe for oneself, not just ask other people, what do you think about it? Do you agree? What is your idea about it? But observe for oneself that when one is angry, resentful, that obviously affects the people with whom one lives and works, even if one represses any expression of the anger, then it manifests in a mood which is very palpable to the people living with a person in, a, in an angry or repressed mood. And living with a person like this, one's own mood may become affected. And in one's relationship then with other people, there is an effect. It spreads. It spreads among animals and it spreads among human beings. It just comes to mind, my husband telling me once working on a horse boat, bringing horses after the war from this country to Poland, and his job was to water long rows of horses in the hull of the boat. And these horses were very close together and quite nervous, particularly when the boat was rocking. And if one horse in the line got freaked out, it went like a wave through the whole row of horses. One kicking, biting, and molesting the next one. We're the same way. Unless their awareness dawns of the process as it happens. Not just a while afterwards, it's all right if it happens afterwards. But if it happens right at the moment, maybe this wave will stop in this attention and awareness within of what's the whole thing that's going on. Not just the little part, but the whole thing. We cannot help but affect each other. Because we're not isolated entities. We live, work, talk, communicate with each other everywhere. Like dropping one stone into a lake. The waves touch everywhere. The most distant shoreline is somehow affected from the waves started by that stone dropped into the lake. And the shoreline is in touch with the air and the heaven, the sky, what's living inside and outside of the lake. It may be minute, but there is interrelatedness of everything with everything. For better or worse. And if one observes that for oneself and sees it, understands it, then there comes a, a real deep sense of responsibility for everything that one does or doesn't do. Doesn't have to be indoctrinated by any teaching. It, if it is indoctrination, then there is a reaction to it. We are just capable of being indoctrinated so long. Either we follow for the rest of our life in that rut of indoctrination, or at one point it's, it's too, too much, we've had enough, and then we react against it, which has nothing to do with understanding and a coming to an end of both indoctrination and reaction and something new taping, taking place.
which is acting out of awareness, not out of principle, guideline or rule. <coughs> the whole question of relationship, domestic relationship has come up in several meetings brought up by people. So we will devote time to it in this talk. Even if one is not living together with someone at home in one's room or apartment. <coughs> Maybe it applies anyways to relationship with friends whom one sees occasionally, or with people with whom one works. What is the basis of our living together? As a couple, <coughs> people are looking at that very seriously. Is it just the sexual, need and gratification, the need to share the work of a household it goes so much more efficiently if both, if two people participate in it. The ache of loneliness being taken care of maybe, hopefully, by being with somebody, so one doesn't have to be alone all the time. And on what basis does one come together in the first place? Has one come together if one is already together? It's different than if one is about to enter into a relationship. Is there this, this deep-seated penchant for romanticism, which we have, nurtured by novels, magazines, stories, movies, TV, serials, some or someone, when sometime or other, we've picked up the ideal image of our partner, our sexual partner. And that is so easily projected onto someone. And then the romantic involvement, not so much with that person, but with the image that this person evokes in one. One has to look at that. And involvement with the image of oneself, which one feels as being boosted. One tells oneself, I'm loved by this person, gives tremendous boost to the image. To such a degree, often, that one is in love more with one's own image than even with the image of the other person. It feels so good to be with this person because this person tells one how beautiful one is, how loving. In this period of romance, so much of which is, may just be inspired by this enormous amount of movies that people see these days since being very small children. And then finding out in the course of time that the other person is not that image that one had. And then the cooling off period, disappointment at finding out how this human being actually is as much in need for support and gratification of 
himself or herself as one is oneself. Two needs meeting each other, wanting to be gratified by the other. And so often in, when the relationship, the, the romantic part cools off and one becomes uh, bored or indifferent or annoyed at what the person actually turns out to be, namely, a while ago I said two needs meeting each other, but this can also be said two conditioned systems meeting each other. One brings all of one's conditioning into the relationship all one's conditioning and the reaction to one's conditioning. One may not have been able to react to one's parents, but one can now react to this partner who seems to nag or demand things just like the parents did. And what one couldn't let out there, one can let out here. Steam, I mean, piled up resentment and reaction. never really deeply or even superficially aware of how conditioning meets conditioning and without awareness that there is no way of getting together. One wanting orderliness, the other one resenting needing to be orderly. Such a relatively small problem but it can become insurmountable because of all the emotions that are triggered, invented, and maybe satisfaction in that venting. Not, let's look at it, but I need to, to be in touch with my feelings. I need to express them. I've never done it all my life. Nobody has ever allowed me to do it. Here is a chance. For, and and it, it, may be the same for both. So, no factual communication is possible because it immediately flares up into release of emotion on both sides. And then, of course, the makeup. Not always, but that in itself can become a real gratifying habit making up, and then the same thing over again the next time some issue comes up, the same issue. And then maybe tiring of, of this and wanting some freshness in a relationship, which means, doesn't it, the image comes up again of the ideal partner. And if the ideal partner is spotted someplace and that person is also showing an interest in one, the same thing starts over. What is felt as freshness in relationship is just the rekindling of fantasy. You may not agree with this but it's not said or put out for agreement, but for looking how does one live together, how does one relate to each other, and what happens when the staling process sets in and one looks for someone else to make one feel happy, gratified, taken care of. If the relationship is already existent and one is not about to walk out of it, one sees the real importance, the, the utter significance of two human beings being able to relate to each other in a caring, intelligent, loving way. 
then where will one start? And as one person asked, is relationship anything but sexual gratification and sharing a house together, companionship to take care of the pain of loneliness? Is that all there is to relationship? one is really seriously and um, passionately interested in how human beings live and live together and the whether there is any possibility at all for human beings to live together truly peacefully creatively caringly, then living in relationship does reveal to one, better than living alone, all one's conditioned responses and reactions and needs and moods, the whole thing. It doesn't come up so much when one lives alone. Other things come up. But living with someone triggers so much to be looked at and questioned instantly. Wondering where it comes from. We, we ask so often, what is it that gets hurt when someone hurts one's feelings, isn't as gracious or as polite or as flattering as one would like to have it go on all the time. What, what is it that gets hurt? And it is, in, is it inevitable that when this is said, this gets hurt? It's, we are totally free to question that. We don't have to take it for granted that this is a, has to be an everlasting process, which has its consequences in that hurt wants revenge, wants retaliation, either to the person who dished it out or to someone else. Quite often in a tense relationship between parents, the children, may get the brunt of that. Apart from the fact that children sense the tension that takes place between parents. Have a direct line, direct lifeline to, to mother and father, which is beyond the words that are spoken, or beyond the veil of secrecy that is sometimes thrown for the sake of the children over difficulties in relation to the children. Better to explain to them what is going on and, and not try to deceive them about, about it. They will just have their own notions and maybe misunderstand or misconstrue things. Very often children think it's their fault. We talked about that yesterday that if a child sees mommy being angry or disgruntled, very automatically made think it's, it was my fault, it was something I did. I felt that way. I always felt that I had done something wrong when my mother was in a bad mood. It didn't occur to me that this could be a process separate from what I had done or hadn't done. Such a close connection. 
based on what happened. The, the early blames and or punishments. Sometimes when parents don't hit their children, my mother and father never hit us, but it came through the eyes, through the look. Which was, seemed to be devastating at times. So what is it that gets hurt in relationship? When somebody says something or does something, can one immediately look at that? Usually our, what we would like to happen, how it's expressed is, I want the other person to understand my feelings. This is how people so often express it. I wish he or she could understand how I feel. But the other person feels the same way. I wish he or she would understand how I feel. So each one wanting to be understood, it's, it is that way. So is it possible to wonder at the same time that this need comes up to be understood and one's misery and hurt, to wonder how the other person feels? genuinely wonder, not now as a technique that one is trying to set an operation to bring about a good relationship, but really wonder. And if, if that happens mutually, then as a first step for getting together, not I want you to know how I feel, but how are you feeling? But it can't be feigned, then it is oh, then it's hypocritical. And at the same time understanding within what it is that gets hurt, whether it is not every time an image of oneself and the image of the other person, which is not like the person acts, he doesn't act like this ideal image one has. or one may project something onto one's partner because he's always been like that. And this time he didn't say it like yesterday or the day before. It came from someplace else, but the projection is already there of what he did before or she did before. Can one become aware of these processes of the human brain, not of my specific brain, but of the human brain, to live in memory images. It is as, as though one snapped pictures of a person when he laughs, when he is mad, when he cries, and then one looks at these pictures, never mind what the person is like, and reacting to the pictures instead that one took for a fraction of a second at one time in the past. But this instant right now is not the past. It is a new moment. And if oneself sees this operation of the image making and doesn't, doesn't become identified with it, sees it, doesn't let it have this tremendous power over our action, voice, behavior, then maybe one can see two actual human beings as they are this moment. There's a, a freeing of the ice. In this light of attention, which must be bare of all justification or uh, judgment, wanting how one wants this person to be.
how is he, how is she, how am I? Not, how do I want him to be so I can feel happy? That's, that's something to observe with utmost care. How almost every moment we want to make another person over into something else. Make him or her over in our image. It seems to be an incessant process with human beings. So one can have what one has up there in one's memory files. But it doesn't work this way. And therefore, the constant frustration at each other. How, how is another person if if one leaves that person completely alone with demands to be different. And not just, I'll try it today and tomorrow and see if there's a result, but no time limit on that at all. To really leave another person be what he is, from moment to moment, or she. Can, can we even bring it off? For, for half an hour. And the same for oneself. So that there is space and time to unfold as one actually is. I don't mean to, now again, hoping for ideal traits to, to unfold. No, whatever unfolds, let it, let it be seen, let it be looked at, give it space. And it, it may be that in this kind of a freedom given to each other, or freedom from each other's incessant demands to be different, one doesn't have to constantly react to this demand to be different. This reaction, as we have talked about, is rooted already in our early childhood. Do this, be like that, don't do that. It goes almost all day long. And as a little child, what chance does one have? Well, one has children develop their own weaponry, defenses and offenses. And we're, we're still children in relationship, still acting out the same reaction against being told what to do and what not to do. And the, the issue itself that may be at hand, namely what needs to be done, uh, isn't seen. Because one doesn't want to be told what to do. So it's, it, one cannot do what needs to be done as long as one is expected with demand or threat to do it. Or if one does it, then there's a mood that sets in. Even though one has done what one is asked to do, one is blamed for the mood with which one is doing it. Why isn't one doing it smilingly, friendly-like? Can we begin to look at what we do to ourselves and each other? maybe come to this point to which we're coming every time. Not do anything to each other, against each other, for each other. 
but to let the energy just be there in, in looking, in beginning to understand this enormous problem of human relationship. Which is just as enormous in one little house as it is in the world. In the Middle East or wherever. And to, to begin discovering not directing with with lots of patience One may find, even though one is into this, yes, one sees the need and one doesn't really have much choice to do this, but one may find that one's partner is not into it, <coughs> is not interested, doesn't understand maybe what one is talking about, if one does talk about it. Does this mean that one cannot do this work alone? Or that therefore one is not willing because he or she doesn't do it, why should I do it? Then one doesn't see the significance of it. Or will one put conditions on it, I will do it if I see results? Results, if there are any, may not be evident for a long time. One doesn't know. But one can start without waiting for these results. Start because it, it beckons to be done, to understand one's deeply seated conditioning, the image making, the image projecting. What it is that gets heard or boosted in flattery. to see if it can finish right then, in that, at that moment of discovery. Deeply, not just superficially. A deep understanding, which comes out of a deep need to understand. Which really may be the most important thing in one's life. Sometimes people ask me, why, why does the ego keep coming back? Or why do I constantly do the same thing over and over again? And, and the question then arises, how important is this to oneself to really discover the root of all human conflict? And wonder whether conflict can end in human relationship if this is if one sees this as the most important thing to find out more important than making money or raising family or uh, getting position getting ahead in the world then very likely the energy is there to look to attend and not to have the pressure of time to get results. Because that itself is a conditioning which is open to questioning. And then if one asks honestly, one may find one is not that interested, and one is more interested in this, this or that. And then to spare oneself this conflict of why don't things change, but to see how it all interconnects with how the energies are spent.
to remain simple and honest. not deceive oneself. Which happens so quickly if we fragment and have one part which wants to be uh, understanding of self and relationship and another part wants to, wants to get along in the world, another part wants a lot of money, another part wants to have um, a career so that the parents can be proud of one. There's this pressure. And all of these parts are separate from each other and are not in unison. You may, you may say now, are you saying that this is what I should do with my life and not have a job, not have a family? This isn't, wasn't said at all. It was said that can one observe how one spends the energies? And can there be attention at any time? Or only on the mat, only on the retreat? Or in this house which one shares with someone? When the moods thicken, the anger either flares up or is repressed. Can there be attention then? Not just of oneself, but the whole situation and what led up to it, and the visible, palpable consequences. To see the whole thing and not come down on it. With judgment, or wanting it to be otherwise. It's for each one of us to, to see and do, or not do. We will end here for today.